Welcome to Amici, news and insight from the New York courts. I'm John Carr. For today's Diversity Dialogue segment, we are joined by the Honorable Shahabuddin Ali, a native of Guyana and the first Muslim man elected to the bench in New York State. Judge Ali, the supervising judge and an acting Supreme Court Justice in New York County Civil Court, describes himself as an immigrant success story and proof that the American dream is alive and well. And by the way, his wife, the Honorable Alicia Alores Ali, is a New York City Family Court judge. Judge, thank you for joining us. First, tell me about your parents, if you would. Uh, what, what did they do in Guyana? Yeah, good morning, John. My parents were both school teachers in Guyana. Uh, they taught at the, uh, the same elementary school in Guyana, and they met as neighbors. It's not an uncommon story. Neighbors usually, you know, the families will match individuals together. Um, so not only do they meet as neighbors, uh, they also work together as teachers. So I'm guessing the education was kind of a, a, a big issue in your family. Very big. I, I mean, there was no, uh, there was no two ways about it. Education was first and foremost, which, um, you know, formed the basis of how I conducted my, conduct myself in my life. Now, your parents named you Shahabuddin, which I hope I've pronounced reasonably well, and which I believe translates to King of Stars. What, yes. what did choosing that name say about your parents' aspirations for their son? So, interestingly enough, I was named after, at that time, the presiding judge of uh, Guyana Supreme Court, Judge Mohammed Shahabuddin. Uh, and my father thought that Muhammad, you know, was a very strong, powerful name, but so was Shahabuddin, the king of stars. And my father admired this judge. Before he was a judge, he was a, a political person, helped write Guyana's constitution when Guyana was liberated from the uh, British rule. So he was a uh, a legend, a folk hero in, in Guyana, uh, Judge Shahabuddin. And my father, my father, um, upon my birth, my father said to my mother, my father has since passed away years ago. My mother's still alive, so she's able to recall these stories from me. But she said to me, when you were born, your father took one look at you and said, this boy will be a lawyer. Not only will he be a lawyer, but he will be the most famous lawyer we have in Guyana. I'm going to name him Shahabuddin. Right? Talk about some pressure, right? About what, <laughs> what careers um, I had before me. Luckily, luckily the stars aligned and law but I, but, but I don't believe it was coincidental. Education and the law was always impressed upon me by my parents. Did you always want to become a lawyer? So, so the answer to that question is, is no. My dream job was that I wanted to play shortstop for the New York Yankees. Well, why didn't you do that? Yeah, you know, they, my age aligned with a fellow who the Yankees drafted as shortstop, and I thought, well, how long could he possibly play? He wound up a playing guy named Derek, Derek Jeter? Derek, Derek Jeter wound up playing for the next 20-something years. Yeah, he um, wasn't bad. <laughs> he was all right. If I, if, I, if I was to bow out to anyone, it would be Derek Jeter. Uh, we actually grew up. Uh, when we left Guyana, we came to this country uh, in 1981 and, and lived on 170th Street in the Grand Concourse in the South Bronx literally in the shadows of Yankee Stadium. Wow. Why did your parents leave Guyana? Like a true immigrant story for a better life, better life for their kids, it was becoming very unsafe. Political unrest. It's not like the States where, you know, it's um, just the sense. It, it becomes very um, dangerous. So a combination of factors, but really just to see a better life for their family. Now, I, I had heard that when you came to America, your family lived in a one-bedroom apartment in the South Bronx, that housed 13 people. Is that true? It is absolutely true. Now, to put it in the context, we lived in a one-bedroom apartment in the, in the Grand Concourse. If anyone's familiar with the apartments in the Grand Concourse, they're grand. They really are large apartments. Uh, but this is, this is a one-bedroom apartment with a formal dining room, living room, bedroom, massive apartment. And it had something that we did not have in Guyana. It had indoor plumbing. In Guyana, we lived in a village and we had an outhouse. I'm often asked, Judge, you've, you've achieved co uh, certain accomplishments very early in your career. How do you stay humble? So I asked my mother once, Mom, what's the, what's the best answer to that question? She said, you want to stay humble? Remind people that you used an outhouse when you were a little boy. And I said, get out of here. What's an outhouse? And she was like, an actual structure with a hole in the ground. So when we came to the country, it was like hitting the lottery. We had an apartment, indoor, <laughs> indoor plumbing. But I am one of seven children, John. I'm one of seven. And there's two parents, so, so at, at the base level, there was always nine of us. 
But when we came to the country, we came with other families. And there were these other people who just would live in our apartment. And, you know, I said to my mother, there was barely enough room for the seven children and parents. Why did you extend to all these folks? And she said, well, there was no other way. You've got to help people when they're in need. So at, at, at the max, it was 13. At, at the normal rate, it was nine. But still, nine in a one-bedroom apartment is challenging. So even nine in a one-bedroom apartment, from your parents' perspective, and I don't know if you yours as a child, that was an improvement over the life you had left. Oh, sure, sure. We lived, I was born in Berbice, Guyana, which is a village. Our house, our home was on stilts because of the flood. And there was no indoor plumbing. There was an outhouse. You know, everything was, a, it, it was a beautiful village, but, you know, it was everything that came along with a village. So we moved down to a city with all of the, including better education, which, you know, was also on my parents' mind when they moved. Did your parents teach when they came to America? No, no. A, 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 again, a typical, you know, immigrant story. They were educated individuals in Guyana teaching, but when they came to the country, they needed to find a job that paid to support their family. So they both worked at a factory in Queens, producing women's uh, garments, and so factory was, workers. And that was their, their career? Uh, my mo- So my father was a factory worker and then went on to work at, I believe, the Department of Sanitation in, 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 in an office at the point he passed away. I think he also worked at New York Law School in the library um, before he passed away. Uh, my mother was at the factory, and at the time my, my father passed away, and he passed away when I was 13, so he passed away about 33 years ago. And when, when that happened, I looked at my parents and I thought, man, these are, you know, they're old folks, right, because they're my parents. Uh, my father passed away when my mother was much younger than I am at this point. So she, she had seven children to support, she just lost her husband. So what she did was took one day off of work to grieve, and then she quit her job at the factory and took on a job as a home health aide so that she could work seven days a week to support her family. Well, it's, it's almost obvious, but I'll, answer, I'll ask you this question anyhow. What are the most important lessons your parents instilled on you as a child? Hard work. Hard work is, there's no substitute for it. Hard work, never make an excuse. You could do... You know, you could do whatever you want as long as you put the work in. And and no matter what you're doing now, you could do more. I do a lot, and I get that from my mother. Whenever my my, my, mother, my mother keeps me humble. Whenever I tell her the, the, the number of things I'm doing, she'll say, that's it? And I said, yes, that's it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's always room to do more. There was never a quit in my – whenever I take on a new assignment, I tell someone, I will succeed at this assignment. And they'll say to me, boy, Judge, that's very confident of you. And I said, no, it's not confident because failure is not an option. Mm -hmm. If my parents failed, we would have starved when they came to this country. If we failed, we would never have gotten out of poverty. Poverty has always been a defining factor of my life. Going to school was not an option because it was a way out of poverty. So those are the things I learned from them. So did did you always intend to attend college? Yes, Yes, because, uh, again, you know, there was never that. We grew up in a very strict educational household. Like, it was either law, medicine, engineering. You know, there was never these liberal art programs. You know? <laughs> so college was college was a necessity. And the question, the open question, which was there for some discretion, was what graduate program are you going to apply to being whether it's going to be medicine, <laughs> law, or engineering? So wh- why did you major in political science at, at CUNY? You know, that was a mistake, to be honest. I I did not have a mentor, and I did not have guidance. I believed that political science, and and by the way, I had had a great time as a political science major at the City College of New York. But I took the, I, I majored in it because, one, I love politics. But I also thought that would make me a better lawyer. The reality is I should have majored in something other than political science, to make me a better lawyer. I should have continued my passion of um, accounting, of numbers, of economics, because it, helped, it would have helped round me out as a lawyer. You know, the political science was great, but it really didn't add much to the depth of my ed- education as a lawyer. Yeah, but who knows? I mean, if, if you had majored in accounting or something, you may have become a commercial lawyer, and then the whole story changes, right? Right, right. That, that's, you know, the one advice, by the way, um, folks will ask me, you know, Shah, Judge, give me advice. 
and I say I don't give advice. I never give advice because you have to lead. You you have to find your own path. My advice only works for me, and my advice is going to be just a recitation of my own um, story. So I tell folks, you know, if if it's political science you love, it's political science you love. But think about the depth. Think about down the road whether or not you're going to have depth to your um, to your portfolio as a lawyer. So then you go on from there to uh, Hofstra Law School. Is it true that that's the first time you had your own room, your own bed? I know it sounds. It <laughs> almost sounds like a sad story when I when I hear it told again. But uh, back to the apartment, nine of us, we had to get creative. We had a bedroom, a large bedroom. So what my parents did was divide the bedroom in half using wardrobes. So my parents slept on one end, and my three sisters slept on the other on one bed. So we didn't have our own beds. We had a, a designated spot on the bed. My two older brothers had a bed in the living room. And then my kid brother and I, who, when I say kid brother, he's like in his early 40s now, we both slept on a mattress on the floor. So we never had, I never had a room because we there was only one bedroom. And I, and I went to a commuter college. So Hofstra Law School, my first year as a first year law student, was the first time I had my own bed. And... A, a, my own room with a door. Did you ever hear your parents talk of feeling underprivileged or anything of that sort? No. Remember, it's perspective, right? We went from a village to a, to a, to a city. We went from a one-room schoolhouse to major school institutions. Calling it underprivileged would be a, a disservice to us because it's a negative way of thinking. You take the positive and you make the best out of it. And your current situation is not your future situation. So we felt like we won the lottery every single day, even though we lived in a, a rundown building. We went to dangerous schools. We lived in a very dangerous neighborhood in the 80s in the Bronx. Um, it was very dangerous. But to us, it was still better. It, w it, w it was success with the best yet to come. Well, that's remarkable. That's wonderful. Now, did, did you know when you were in law school, when you were at Hofstra, what type of law you would practice? No, no. Again, that, that, that theme of poverty, right? I wanted to get a job that was going to pay me a million dollars because I wanted to stop being poor. And, and now uh, as a judge, you make that a million dollars, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get to that in a second. But, um, but uh, that, 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 that would be corporate law, right? You make a lot of money as a corporate lawyer, except it never really interests me. So I wound up taking a job working for the Administration for Children's Services. But that, I took that job because, one, I needed a job out of law school. But it also was very interesting. So um, I did not know going, I knew going into law school that I wanted to make my law degree literally pay, pay me better, right, or make it worth. But while I was going through law school, I had a, a real conflict following my heart with what I love, which was helping people, social service, being in court, and following what would help my bank account, which is corporate law. And then at the end of the day, that conflict came to a head, and I said, well, I'm going to work for the government. It seems like you know much of your career centered on uh, children. I mean, you've prosecuted abuse and neglect cases. You prosecuted felonies and sex crimes committed by juveniles. Why did you gravitate to 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 that type of practice? You know, John, I've always been the recipient myself and my family of the help of others. When we came to this country, we relied on public assistance. We were on food stamps, and I tell people it's it's, it's food stamps back in the day. Food stamps when there were coupons with, with the faces of presidents on it, not the new EBT cards that look like credit cards. We relied on uh, rental assistance. We, we, we very quickly moved off of those. But there was always someone there to help us, and that I felt like it was a way for me to return that favor and help others. And also working with families and children, it's, it's, it's almost the, the, the most immediate way to see an impact. You could help a family very quickly where I didn't see that impact on like a transactional uh, case. I just didn't see it. So I wanted to, I wanted to pay myself, but I also want to pay my soul, right, to help others. And that's really our duty in life. Is to, it's what we do for others. What a wonderful statement. Now you you first became a judge, I think, after you were elected in 2018. How does someone like you, coming from the background you did, even position himself to to make that a possibility? Yeah, my path to the bench was certainly not one that's that that was planned. I wound up living in my uh, in my adult years in in Manhattan in Washington Heights with my wife, who happens to be a family court judge. She's appointed by the mayor, and our now 16-year-old son. 
and we, we were living in Washington Heights, and I always knew I wanted to be involved in a court system. I always thought I wanted to be a judge, but didn't know the process. And the process is really what, what keeps folks out of the judiciary. And then one day, we were at our apartment, and there was a lot of noise coming from the apart from, from outside. And I said to my wife, boy, I really wish somebody did something about the noise, the, 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 the sanitation issues. My wife said, well, you could wish it, or you could do something yourself about it. And I said, fine, I will do something about it. And I looked up ways to become involved, and I looked up community boards, and I wound up applying and becoming a member of Manhattan Community Board 12, which covers Washington Heights and Inwood. Fast forward a year and a half later, not really that long after, I became the chairman of the community board. So I ran the whole board for three years. And during that time, I became very active in community work, in politics, and then I learned about this possibility of becoming an elected judge. So I started to, to engage that process. So that's how I first learned of the process. So it sounds like basically you start with networking. Yeah. You get to yeah. help people. Yeah, networking really, you know, there's one thing to, to, to say your intentions, right? But a lot of folks could pick it up by your actions. They could figure out, all right, this guy has his heart in public service. Maybe, you know, and, and the traditional routes from a chairman of a community board are either the New York City Council, the Assembly, the State Senate, or the bench if you're a lawyer. So it was one of those natural progressions to continue the love of public service in another way. So in your two-judge household, which, which of you is a court of last resort? <laughs> it's, usually, it's usually my mother, <laughs> grandma. And, and, and I often defer to uh, uh, Judge Alora Zali, um, as, as she technically uh, has been on the bench longer than I have. So she's senior, she has senior status. <laughs> Now, I know you're president of the Asian American Judges Association of New York and a member of the South Asian Bar. Why is diversity on the bench important? I mean, is it just a matter of ethnic pride or, do, or does it matter in a substantive way? Very substantive. In fact, I think, you know, many, many brilliant legal, many brilliant minds have, have spoken about this issue in ways much better than I can. So I'll just recite um, what they've said is that Diverse benches bring diverse uh, opinions, perspectives, which then come out to be better just results. So it's not just a matter of ethnic pride, but it's a matter of perspective. I think I bring a perspective that I, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever heard any, any, anyone say. You know, um, we talk about individuals who are parents of immigrants, right? When, when, when you go through the elected process, everyone tells their story. I, I don't think anyone I've heard has ever said, I'm the actual immigrant themselves, which, which, which I am, you know, so a diverse bench just ultimately results in better informed decisions. And then everything else that comes along with it, with the, with the diverse bench. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. We still haven't had an Asian in the Court of Appeals, but... Um, oh, you know, you know, John, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share with you my report um, that, that I did. Uh, at, in, in, so May is Asian American Pacific Islander Month, which uh -huh. I think this is why we're... This is why we're doing this. Uh -huh. um, and I uh, put together a report um, highlighting our um, the Asian judges' position in the court system. Oh, wow. And, and uh, you would be surprised or maybe not so surprised to know uh, you highlighted the Court of Appeals, but we've never had, we've never had a judge on the, for example, the... Um, the third department, the fourth oh. department, we've only had our first. We've only had our first judge on the second department. Huh. Uh, we've we've never had a South Asian administrative judge. I'm the highest ranking Asian judge in the state now. Now you're also a member of the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission, which is the first court-based entity in the nation committed to racial and ethnic fairness in the courts. Why did you get involved with that? When I joined the court system. First of all, I, I it, it was literally one of one of these dreams that, that had just come come true, and I, and I made a pledge to myself that every day that I'm a judge is a happy day. Doesn't mean the day goes out the way I want it to be, or that it's going to be. I'm going to make the most out of my time as a judge, which meant first and foremost doing a good job on the bench, uh, you know, doing your job well, 
uh, which, which, which I'm hoping I, I, I've done. I've been elevated to now a supervising judge. But once I started to you know, sort of get the hang of becoming a judge, I thought, well, what else can I be doing? Remember going backwards to my mother's story of always doing more? I said, what else can I be doing to help my community or, or, or to give a voice to a voice that might not be there? The Muslim community, the South Asian community. You know, there are only 61 Asian judges in the state, making us about 4%. We can easily get lost. You know, statistically, that's what they call an insignificant number when you get to that that low. So I looked around, and I actually attended an event put on by the Franklin H. Williams Commission. And it's not, it's not uncommon that after the Williams Commission events, and I know you're very familiar with the Williams Commission, after their events, their application, the applications um, received, the, that number goes up. People really want to get involved. So I did the same thing. I applied after I attended an event because I figured that an Asian American perspective, a South Asian American perspective, an Indo-Caribbean perspective, and a Muslim perspective could be used. And I, and I brought all of those perspectives in. So I thought that if, if nothing else, it's a commission of 25 members. There has to be room for at least one of us. And that may be the first time in its 30-year history that it was ever represented in that way. I think so. I'm willing to help anyone, not just an Asian American, because remember, diversity helped us all. So it could be someone who's white, black, it doesn't matter to me, right? Because, you know, inclusion means letting us in, but it doesn't mean excluding others. Like, that, that's the other, that's the reverse side of it, right? Like, we don't want that either. And, and, I, and I tell folks, I'm willing to help anyone, really, I am, who needs help under one strict condition that they put the work in. It cannot just be talk to me about this and they abandon it, right? Or that they don't put the work in or they're relying on me to do the work for them. So I am, I'm gonna give this, I'm gonna share this and then I'm gonna say, if you want help, you have to show, you have to do the hard work. And I've actually stopped helping some folks because I realized they were not interested in the hard work. So I'm going to use this to help me, you know, figure out who's who's that candidate I, who wants to do the work and who wants to get to the next level. Now, um, you mentioned your, your faith. What ethnic or religious customs have you retained from your childhood and, and shared with your family? You know, religion, I say, doesn't define who I am, but, but certain culture, cultural practices that's born from religion um, does. Uh, and, and, and two that are very prominent in my life is um, one of charity, but charity in other ways, charity in either if we're permitted to economically, but I'm very big on charity in helping others because that's my form of charity. In fact, Ramadan just, just concluded, and one of the ma major tenets of Ramadan is charity, and, and I do so by helping others. The other is also just a, a pureness to your actions. You know, you don't ever have to apologize or explain if you do something for the right reasons. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you only have to answer to yourself. So do things for the right reasons. Be pure about your actions. You know, don't let anger or hatred or any of these other uh, vile um, feelings dictate your actions. Just be pure and you'll sleep well at night. That's wonderful. Now, I'm, I'm particularly intrigued by the, the, what, what you said about you never have to apologize or explain if you do something for the right reasons. And I have a 16-year-old that I'm, that I'm raising, and, I, and I'm hoping to raise him as to be a fine you know, human being. And I said to him, you know, we, well, I said to everyone, is if you follow your heart, you know, and, and if you think you're doing things for the right reasons, then you never have to explain to anyone you know, or, or try to convince them. You know, you just have to think, you just have to know that it might not be correct, but just do it for the right reasons and follow that compass, follow that guide. And I have to tell you, John, I, I didn't quite understand that concept in my, in my maybe 20s and 30s. So hopefully I'm, 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 I'm coming to grips with that concept now, but I do believe it's a beautiful concept. It is um, a very beautiful concept. Very yeah. Beautiful and concept. it's actually helped save me a lot of grief because I, you know, not, not that I've always been right. And not that I've always had consensus, but I know at the end of the day, if I'm okay with my actions, then that's all that matters to me. Yeah, it probably helps you sleep well at night as a judge. I mean, you, you, you make difficult decisions sometimes. Sure. Uh, sometimes it's not clear cut right and wrong. Sometimes the consequences of being wrong, despite your best intentions, can be catastrophic. So it sounds like if you know applying that philosophy to your judicial position, uh, that enables you to 
sleep well. Yeah. You know, I spent um, more than a decade, maybe a decade and a half as a, as a public defender and I had clients and I, and I was a litigator for, 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 for decades. Whenever we saw, whenever I saw a judge who really grappled and looked like they were trying to make the right decision, I was okay with the decision, even if it was adverse to me. So while that's not why I do it, it, it you, you know, if, if, if it's organic and authentic to you, it, it does come across. And that's, that's what I would like to portray to litigants as well. That, well. that it might not be in your favor, but this guy is at least giving it a hard look at he's doing the right thing. And I think people in general accept that. Even, yeah. if, even if they lose, as long as they think they were treated fairly, they're Absolutely. generally okay. Yeah. What do you wish that people better understood about the uh, Muslim faith? You know, that it, it's really a, a peaceful faith, you know, and, and that the commonality amongst other faiths are just, are just so um, striking, right? Like, it should not be pitted against Christianity or Judaism, where the, the major tenets are all, are all one and the same. Um, it really is. Uh, so it should not be, and I know pop culture and social media makes it out, you know, Hollywood and Netflix will have these shows that makes everyone feel like they're a fanatic. Um, uh, I, I, I just wish that, uh, you know, folks just looked beyond uh, the radicalism of, 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 of it. And that just might be a, a branding or marketing that we're just folks, you know, like everyone else. And, and at the end of the day, I mean, gosh, at the end of the day, as, 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 as a person, as a Muslim, what are my concerns? It has nothing to do with religion. My concerns, which are probably the same as someone who's Jewish, who's Catholic, is am I going to be able to provide for my family? Is my child or family going to be healthy and safe? You know, or am, am I going to be free of any sort of illness? You know, you know, the same things that we all worry about. So, like, we're, we're, we're literally more, more, we have more in common than we do, than we don't, and that we shouldn't, you know, really tag and negative associations with any religion. Yeah, it seems like if you look at the various religions, Judaism, Christianity, uh, Muslim, whatever, and boil it down to its essence and, and not get hung up with the details, it seems like the basic message of all of these is really the golden rule. Sure. Absolutely. I agree. You know, there's a common um, Islamic reading um, that, 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 that means peace be unto you, right? And, 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 and during Ramadan, it was pronounced and, you know, we, you know, it, it, it was uh, put on, put on highlight because of the, the, the holy month. And I, and I spoke at an event and I said, you know, if we look at what that saying means against what's going on in this world now, I think we should all be saying it, right? Because, I mean, who doesn't want peace to be beyond them? Like, we all should be saying this, right? And that every religion has a saying that confers peace upon each other. Oh, that's fascinating. What do you wish people better understood about why people emigrate to the United States? Yeah, it really is the American story. It's um, the American success story. You know, folks have asked me, um, did my dream come true when I became a judge? My American dream. And I said, no, my American dream did not come true when I became a judge. My American dream came true on January 11th of 1981 when I came to this country. Because when we came here, every opportunity that was available to us was available. That's the dream. What we did with it was up to us. But the opportunity, that's the word, right? So the becoming a judge is a byproduct of the opportunity. You know, being a president of an association is the byproduct. Whatever else I've accomplished, that's not the dream. People come to this country for opportunity. What I want, what I've always wanted, was not to be held back and not to be, you know, have obstacles placed in front of me. Give me a fair shot, give me an opportunity, and I'll earn it. And that's what the dream is. And I think that's what people come here for. And that dream is still alive. What a wonderful and inspiring message. And I want to thank you so much for your, for your time, Judge, and thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. Thank you, John. Thank you for this time.